Welcome to Mission Evolution Radio Show with Gwilda Wiaka, bringing together today's leading experts to uncover ever-deepening spiritual truths and the latest scientific developments in support of the evolution of humankind. For more information on Mission Evolution Radio with Gwilda Wiaka, visit www.missionevolution.org. And now, here's the host of Mission Evolution, Miss Gwilda Wiaka. Hello, and welcome to Mission Evolution, the place to find the latest knowledge from today's leading experts. This hour, we'll explore the power of conscious response. As our world continues to go through rapid shifts and upheaval, it's easy to feel like powerless passengers on a runaway train. While there are some things we can control, there seems to be many more that we cannot. What we can manage, however, is our response to our circumstance. Will that be enough to make a difference in the world? Joining us from Israel to explore our options is Miles Kessler. Miles is a lineage holder in both the Mahasi tradition of Buddhist meditation and the Iwama tradition of Akito. For over 25 years, Miles has been teaching meditation, embodiment, and spiritual awakening to thousands of people around the world. As a former director of Aikido Without Borders, Miles established dojos in Israel and Palestine, where he facilitated cross-cultural trainings in the martial art of Aikido. Miles is the director of the Integral Dojo, an online school of meditation, Aikido, and Integral Practices. His website, theintegraldojo.com. Miles, thanks for joining us on Mission Evolution. Hi, Gwilda. Nice to be here. Thanks for the invitation. It's, I think we're going to have a lot of fun today, because if there's one thing we need at this point in our world is how do we manage ourselves within all the changes? Yeah, absolutely. I agree. So how long have you been um, practicing and teaching martial arts? Oh, uh, yeah, t- martial arts. I've been teaching martial arts probably the last 25 years, but I've been practicing since since I was a child. I was either doing um, either martial arts or sports as a child, did a few different ones. Then at the age of 22, I, I discovered, found Aikido, and I never turned back. <laughs> um, there's one thing that um, martial arts seems to be infamous for, and that's teaching a person self-control and discipline. Um, Did you find that to be the case? And how do you feel that being involved in it all that time has uh, impacted you? Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you look at martial arts, I mean, there's fighting, which is definitely, you know, people can get better, faster and stronger at that. But when you bring in the art aspect, the martial art, it's much more of an, an, an external and internal developmental process and that requires that you do um, learn to I guess it early on people learn how to control their their basic instincts but but later as you get more mature in the practice you learn how to integrate them in a way where um, you know the fight flight freeze instincts will come up in any type of conflict you know especially in martial art that's what's so wonderful about practicing in martial arts because you get to face those instincts in ourselves and others uh, you know like in a, in a very clear and direct way, but the art aspects actually helps us to develop the skill and the, um, the skill and the, the ability to um, not be captured by those fight, flight, freeze instincts. So that's and that seems difference. to be how, that seems to be how we're living right now, isn't it? Is everybody's, everything is unpredictable and everybody just kind of goes into fight or flight and people are getting aggressive or they're withdrawing from life. Um, and it seems to be a serious problem. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It is a serious problem. I mean, it's, it's, you know, we, we, I, mean, I suppose that the pandemic um, multiplied the, the degree of this problem quite a bit, but you know, when we lose our basic stability, our basic security, And, you know, I I do martial arts, but I also do meditation, Buddhist meditation. The first teaching of, you know, the Buddha was um, uh, the truth of of, uh, dukkha, the truth of suffering, that it exists. It's not always there. It comes, it goes, but it's always cycling back around and we need to accept that. But we just don't want to accept that. We want to have a stable, secure existence. And it's wonderful to live in a stable, secure place. I've been I've been and lived in countries that are not so stable and not so secure. So I know how life can be there. Um, but uh, we should all uh, aspire to have some type of stability. But there is no security. Ultimately speaking, 
there is no security. It's all, you know, the 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 uh, the, the, the 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 Titanic is going down. <laughs> and, there's, and there's and a constant our, change. Going, yeah, and I don't mean that our countries are falling apart. Some in some cases is. I I mean in a basic kind of kind of a Buddhist level that well look you know this is all impermanent. Everything that we have and it's wonderful that it's here now, but it is going to pass. And in that sense, uh, if we embrace that rather than try to um, uh, control it, um, that's the first empowering move for personal development. In this culture, and I'm speaking about the United States because you're over in Israel, but in, in mm -hmm. this culture, it seems like we have been taught to strive for um, gain and permanence and security and material things. Mm -hmm. And uh, that leaves us or doesn't that leave us ill-equipped to deal when those things aren't there? Yeah, I mean, I, I, by the way, I'm American. I grew up in America. I lived there for you know the first 26 years of my life, and then I moved to Japan and Burma, and I ended up settling in Israel. But um, it's kind of, as it is in the States, it's just like that here in Israel. It's just like that in Palestine. It's just like that in Burma, where I lived. It's just like that in Japan, where I lived. It's kind of a human condition that we scramble we endeavor we make efforts to kind of you know gather some type of material security and and again material security is good to have i hope we all have insurance you know i did grow up in the states but here in israel there's national insurance so everything's kind of given to you you don't have to scramble and i know there's a lot of people in the states that do struggle to you know make ends meet around insurance so when you experience that, you realize the insecurity of things, and it is important to have some stability. But we have to always remember that at the bottom of it all, um, it's all th that nothing remains, that, that nothing is permanent. And that's just kind of a, a spiritual truth. And, you know, sometimes I'll be in a, um, an environment and something will happen. OK, whether yeah. a fire yeah. alarm goes off or traffic jam right. or whatever. And I, I'm, I'm a people watcher. So you look around and people are all responding in a different way. And many of them are just freaking out. And it kind of leaves one wondering, what are you going to do when something real happens? Um, mm. So, again, we're looking at response here. So let's let's go into response a little bit. Sure. What, how great. would you define it as, as, we, as you mentioned it, as we're going to be working with it here today? Okay, great. So let's 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 use the word reaction and the word response. So reaction is um, a reflexive instinct that comes when there's when there's a stimulus, so-called trigger. Could be you hear the sound of a, a, a siren, or or you know somebody drops a, a pan and makes a loud noise, or and if you've had some past experience, you know traumatic experience that has left an imprint on the nervous system that is still not quite healed, let's say, um, then the smallest, the smallest sound is going to trigger it. And to respond under those conditions is very, very difficult. Um, response requires uh, awareness. Response requires a capacity of awareness that can contain a, a, um, an experience that would normally trigger our fight, flight, freeze. And that capacity can be developed. It's not given. So maybe children have. Yeah, maybe does it does it kind of it. give you does it kind of give you back um, control over how you respond to the stimuli? Um, what it what gives you back about? is, yeah. What it gives you back. I mean, I, I don't want to use the word control here because not that's your problem with the word control, but what because what we normally do is we try to control the stimuli. You know, something happens. I try to control, and I have two small kids. So if they're getting close to the street, I'm, suddenly I can be like that. And yes, I want to control them. That's important. Keep them away from danger. Absolutely important. But the more that I'm actually in my center and I, I take care of what needs to be taken care of from a place of choice rather than from reactivity, uh, it'll just be more skillful. I'll either move in a more skillful way. I'll be able to see this situation more skillfully and even not just take care of you know, not the, the kid's safety, but also take care of their, their, their bodies, their emotions, their minds at the same time. So I can actually contain the situation much better. But I have to have that container of the awareness. And it's that container of awareness which actually is kind of the turning point, developmentally speaking. So when, when do we start to develop that? Well, so let's let's just let's just start from the beginning then. So we're all born at, at zero. So we're all born with the basic um, fight survival instincts. You know, we are 
humans, but you know, we're not so far from the animal kingdom. And the instincts that we see in animals, we can also see in ourselves. Hopefully they're not uh, you know, ruling the day, but we do have them. We certainly have fight, flight and freeze instincts. And um, what's important to understand about this is that that's an intelligence. Yeah, so, so we embrace it. It's like, no, that's, you know, the, the, the cavemen and the cavewomen who, who um, ran away when they were scared, even if there wasn't really something to run away for, from, they're the ones that survived. The cavemen and cavewomen that were, were chilled and relaxed and didn't think there was any danger, and then, you know, the tiger came from behind the bushes and ate them, they didn't survive. They, they, they got selected out of the human project. So their genetic code was not passed on. So our ancestors, your ancestors and my ancestors were the ones that were paranoid and freaked out. They were the survivors. So we have that. We, we've inherited that DNA. We've inherited that, that, that survival instinct. And, you know, heaven forbid that we're ever in such a situation. But if there, we are in such a situation, it's good that we have that basic intelligence. But we don't want to take that basic intelligence to Thanksgiving or, you know, home for the holidays or to the football game on Sunday. Um, because that will just kind of you know break things down. So we have to learn how to overcome those instincts. And usually the way that we do it is we we go from this kind of survival instinct to a more of an emotional instinct, or you could even say emotional reactions. I have as much emotional reactions as the next person. Hopefully, I have a little bit more space with them, just because of my practice. But you know, I have my good days and I have bad days. But emotional reactions are still reactive. In other words, there's not there's no choice there, um, but we also have to understand that they are also an intelligence. They may not be, you know, when I get angry about something or when I get uh, 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 freaked out about something, or if I try to um, uh, tell a, jo a clever joke to to diffuse the the stress. This is all fine things. It may have a function, um, but again, it's not a higher intelligence. It's a basic instinct. And um, like, you know, anger can move a lot of energy. Um, always telling jokes can actually relieve a lot of stress. So there may be ways to, um, there may be, uh, what do you say? Um, uh, it may have important functions in society. But again, we don't want to always live from a place where we're, we're just kind of, um, our emotions are controlling us. And again, we don't so want to control you our emotions. Are you talking about yeah. coming out of or acknowledging the knee-jerk reaction, but before we take action, making a conscious mm -hmm. choice as to what's going to work in the situation best? Not yet. I'm not there okay. yet. <laughs> not so there if yet. I don't fight, fight <laughs> yeah. Let's say let's say conflict comes up and, and I don't fight or I don't fly fly away and I don't freeze in that. I just kind of try I, I force myself to stay connected to the situation, then I'm inside, it's going to be really hard. So there could be a lot of anger coming up or a lot of fear coming up, a lot of, and, that, and that's what I mean by emotional reactions. If I speak or act from those emotions that are coming up, then it will perpetuate conflict. In a survival situation, it might actually be good, but it, it, it will continue to perpetuate conflict. So it's still not that resolution stage. So these are basic instincts. And the reason I bring these up is because it's important to understand that these are intelligences. They, they actually help us cope survive and even function even though they're largely dysfunctional they help us to function uh in 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 life and and they're basic so these are the basic for um for evolving and the more that i'm aware of these things the more i get to know myself the more i can move up to that next stage is where we start to bring in mindfulness awareness presence we start to develop a container of awareness that, that can actually when these waves or instinctual waves come up I actually have the capacity to be with them, to ride that wave of intensity, you know, the old count to 10, and then watch that white wave of intensity go down. That is, it turns out that that is a key, um, it is a, a cornerstone developmental practice to do. Well, we're going to have to pick up on that particular cornerstone on the other side of a station break. From the Canada-US border in the southern region of Niagara, traveling north in Ontario's Golden Horseshoe, then, 
East and west of the Greater Toronto Area, there is growing awareness and excitement as more and more people are starting their day with Beautiful Mind Coffee, the delicious healthy coffee that your brain will love. Made with ethically sourced 100% Arabica coffee, Beautiful Mind Coffee is roasted and ground in small batches, to ensure each bag contains a wonderful full-bodied artisan coffee. Scientifically formulated, Beautiful Mind Coffee is the only coffee blend that contains three herbal ingredients found to aid in boosting your daily mental clarity and focus. Maca root powder, green tea extract and American ginseng, have been selected for their ability to support good brain health. Taking care of your brain's health now can help delay or prevent the onset of cognitive dysfunction, including dementia, Alzheimer's, and more general memory loss as you get older just by enjoying the delicious flavor of our roasted coffee and herbal ingredients found exclusively in Beautiful Mind Coffee. Beautiful Mind Coffee is now available at Amazon.ca and soon to be available in selected locations near you. In Hamilton, Ontario, Beautiful Mind Coffee is now available at Livelong Wellness Clinic, located at 189 Houston Street South. Beautiful Mind Coffee can be ordered by telephone by calling 416-436-3675 or 905-536-2450. Why have a good cup of coffee when you can have a great cup of Beautiful Mind Coffee that's good for your brain? For more information on Beautiful Mind Coffee, visit us online at www.beautifulmindcoffee.ca. Hello again, this is Mission Evolution missionevolution.org. With us this hour discussing the power of conscious response is Miles Kessler. His website, theintegraldojo.com. Miles, we were talking about uh, a container of awareness. Um, and you were saying how that we have all these different intelligence, whether they're fight or flight or uh, emotional response. But within that, if you can have a container of awareness, uh, then that gives you more options. Would you continue with that discussion, please? Yeah, sure. And, and what, we're, what we're looking at is kind of a developmental model that, that is kind of a vertical development that we evolve through stages. Or you could think of concentric circles where we actually grow and we have more capacity, more and more competency. And to really overcome our basic instincts, whether they be uh, fight, fight, flee, fight, flight, freeze instincts or uh, survival instincts can take, uh, sorry, or emotional uh, instincts can take quite a bit. It's like, it's like you know, the, the, a rocket. Um, uh, something like 80% of the rocket fuel is for that first 20% of the lift, you know, and the, the rest of the journey it uses less fuel because that's where the gravitational pull is strongest. So we often get pulled into, you know, we get hijacked by our emotions or by our instincts. And, and again, God bless us all. There's no, no judgment for that. That's how it is. And it, we just need to work with that in one way or the other. And it might include therapy. It might include, you know, some type of healing or whatever, but um, whatever the case is to heal that or to overcome that or to evolve beyond that, we need that container of awareness. And that's where basic meditation or basic awareness training comes in. Okay. So um, aren't our responses also a physical response? So we have all this brain chemistry and, and adrenaline, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. that's impacting our right. bodies. Uh, right, right up front. That's the first thing that happens. So yeah. can the the practices you're talking about, can those counteract that? Oh, absolutely. So so these are physical, uh, even, even brain chemistry, you know, um, cortisol or whatever might be shooting through our system um, uh, and, you know, lighting a fire underneath our backside to get us moving. Um, that is physical, right? It's a physical thing. Even, even brain chemistry is physical. Our nervous system is physical. Our, um, you know, the triggers that are in our body are physical. The awareness that I'm talking about is non-physical. Now, it is in the mind, but um, uh, paradoxically, it's also non-local. So the experience of the awareness is that it actually is not bound by any physical kinks that we may have in our system. And, um, and it's bringing that kind of, and that seems to be the magic, uh, well, one of the, 
one of, like I said, the cornerstone practices is kind of, the, I wouldn't say it's, it, yeah, maybe it is the magic ingredient for healing any type of um, entanglements or, or blocks that we have in our system. We might have to do some therapy, like I said, and really work through some issues, but the awareness is key. And just like um, the uh, psychologist, psychiatrist, actually, uh, Victor Frankl said um, that between um, uh, stimulus and response is a space. And in that space, we have our choice. And in that choice, you find your freedom. And Viktor Frankl was a Holocaust survivor, so he was quite a, um, you know, quite quite a human being. And he discovered this. And, and this he is knew this what is he the spoke, key. Apparently, yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. So, and this is the key turning point. So um, I'm sure right now some of the audience is going, okay, so we're in a fight or flight response situation. Uh, We have to discern whether it's, you know, clear and present danger or one of our triggers from our history, dotty, dotty. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Do you sit down and contemplate your navel? I mean, how how do you get meditation to work in the moment? Well, if you, if, if the conditions are right, yeah, definitely sit down and, and maybe meditate a little bit, If you're, but don't sit down in the middle of the road. If a truck is coming, you know, you, you, when it's time to act, act, when it's time to speak, speak. Um, usually traditionally we make hay when the sun shines. So we, we try to set up conditions, ideal conditions where we can actually sit down and not be disturbed from the outside, not be triggered by anything and um, traditional meditate, you know, close your eyes and turn in. And you know, we seclude the body by going into a quiet room and we seclude the mind, maybe closing the eyes, but turning in. And it's the turn, there's lots of great meditation techniques, as you know, uh, but the turning in is really the key. It's the beginning of understanding our own interiors. And like I so said- So are, 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 you, are you saying like, like training in martial arts, when you do the routines over and over and over again, they become a subroutine that you can then call on. Is it the same way with meditation? Yeah. So, so it does become like a, 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 a you. In, it's like you're installing really healthy habits. You know, we have a lot. Everybody, all of us have bad habits of the mind, and mindfulness, for example, and certainly faith and and joy and loving kindness and uh, compassionate uh, awareness and um, equanimity. These are all very skillful, wholesome mental states that do get developed in the, in the practice, in any type of internal awareness practice, specifically in meditation. However, so walk us, walk us through this a little bit. So if, yeah. if you are, if you choose to get a practice of meditation, okay, mm-hmm. and then you are practicing your practice of meditation during times when mm-hmm. you don't necessarily aren't un- under stress or needing it, then right. how do you take it from there into the moment when you're uh, in front of an oncoming train or, or uh, mm-hmm. think you might be, or, you know, how, how do you bring it into the moment? Is, is there a little key to carry that over? Well, I mean, there is a key. So, but, but when you sit down and meditate in ideal conditions, um, it, sooner or later, there is going to be a train coming at you, but it's going to be in the mind. So all the stuff, all the stuff that we experience in the world, you know, the fears, the desires, the aversions or whatever, whatever, the doubts, the, the judgment of others, the judgment, all of these things that come up in the world, when we sit, when we sit down and turn in and close our eyes, they come up in our interior as well. And that's ah, exactly so where, and that's exactly where the, the process of purification happens. So you're actually setting yourself in a position to run across your own shadows, run across your own demons, and deal with them when you're not having to also deal with the world at large? Yeah, again, so we're setting up ideal conditions, so they will come up. There's a process of purification. So, you know, you heat up, you heat up a piece of, uh, let's say, gold, like raw gold that you pull out of the ground. When you heat it, it melts the gold. And the dross or the dirt or the rocks or the dust that's inside the gold floats to the surface as an impurity and then it gets removed same thing when we start to do of course meditation but any type of internal awareness practice there are going to be impurities that are going to float to the surface of the mind now if you have a formal practice you'll actually understand through the teaching that that's the practice if you don't then you might actually identify with those things so if anger comes up you just identify oh this isn't really my practice or if doubts come up, Oh, this isn't my practice. But if you can stay with those, it will purify. And then when it's the purified mind, that practice of working with my own interior is it, it's the same exact practice when it comes to working with the world. You know, when, so does, when it, does it help? Situation comes up. Yeah, go ahead. 
does it help you s start to more clearly recognize when you're coming from your own patterns uh, versus a, um, an appropriate response in the moment? It does. It totally does. I mean, that's sorry. We have a little bit of a lag. That's why sometimes it's a, it's a uh, I'm stepping on your words. So forgive me for that. Not but, a problem. Um, the wind is howling here. So <laughs> yeah. okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, to thy own self be true. And then when it when it you know that we learn about ourselves the most by turning in and then how we relate to the world. But this is, again, we're looking at different stages. So I'm, I started to talk a little bit about meditation, but this awareness in terms of the, uh, the evolution of response or conscious response, this is still kind of, it's, it's foundational, but it's mid-level. And when you can have an awareness-based response, what happens is, you know, something arises in life, Maybe let's just talk about conflict for a moment. It could be driving a car. It could be a, 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 little, a, a small uh, argument with a, with a partner, or it could be, you know, something happening at the market or, or a political discussion or health discussion, whatever. There's all kinds of, like you said, we are in a world of crisis right now in this moment. So you don't have to look far to find conflict, to find an opposite, you know, an opposite opinion that triggers us. But if I can hold that, if I can hold that with awareness without getting sucked in, without getting hijacked by my own emotions, without getting, um, you know, uh, collapsing into um, a, 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 a opposition, then there's a potential for that conflict to resolve. Without the awareness, there is no potential for conflict to resolve. It can disappear. It can go away. They can go away. I can go away. I can run away. But it won't resolve. And that's that's the key. That's the, that's the whole point of this evolution of response. So if it doesn't resolve, then it's just lurking to come up the next time the proper stimulus is available. And that's the, 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 this is the story of human history. You know, we, we human we've repeating the same history, our whole you know the whole existence of humanity. You know, and and the, the, it's and it's very simple. Conflict is a zero sum game. There's a winner, and there's a loser, and if I'm the winner, great. I take all the marbles and I go my way and I'm very, very satisfied at the expense of somebody else. Mm -hmm. And this is and how, isn't no that way, the way the world operates right now? Uh, isn't that what we're uh, seeing Largely. Yeah, yeah, sure. Largely. There are some shining spots in the world, even at a you know governmental or organizational level or, or, or even like corporation level. There are some shining spots, but largely human nature has been, has been, you know, is kind of calling the shots that there is a zero sum. The bottom line is zero sum. But another thing that we're, we're facing, uh, Gwilda, and I think that this is one of your inspirations for doing this show is that we also have the, the capacity to see that this problem, the systemic problem is not going to, it's not sustainable that we need to do something different. And the dawning of that um, idea or that, that perspective and then the accompanied sense of responsibility that comes with that is the hope. And we're going to talk about the other levels of development uh, from here. So uh, we have a little time left in this segment. So I'm okay. sure everybody's kind of wondering, okay, this sounds good. <laughs> it's a lot of theory here. Mm -hmm. But how long does it take to put this in practice? How much work does well, it I take? Mean, What's it going to cost me? Yeah. <laughs> well yeah so I, I, it can cost a lot but uh um it will cost you no less than a total commitment now that doesn't mean you have to change your life it doesn't mean you have to sell the car it doesn't mean anything it just means that we have to get on board with the with the the um greater the evolution project basically we need to get on board. And, 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 and there's another thing about that is that people won't get on board with the evolution project until they have the understanding that there is such a thing. People won't have the understanding that there is such a thing until they develop a certain amount of self-awareness. People won't develop a certain amount of self-awareness until they learn to work with the emotional hijack. People won't be able to work with the emotional hijack until they overcome the fight, flight, freeze instinct. So it, there's a cause and effect thing, and a lot of that is developmental. So just like our kids grow through stages, adults also, we grow through stages. Do we do it culturally as well? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Do we do it culturally, as a culture as well? I mean, are, are all well, of us... I mean, 
in the process. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sure there's pockets of culture all over the world where these are, this is happening. But basically, when two people come together and start to install these, let's say, more inclusive habits, um, then a culture is born. So there are cultures that go with that. And every culture has its its strength, its weaknesses, its um, its shortcomings, and its and its bright spots. And also, not to mention its shadows. But that's we're going to save shadow uh, for a whole other whole other conversation. Let's not complicate it too much. And again, we're real close to the end of this segment. But do you see this as starting as an inside job with the individual? Totally, it's totally an inside job. Absolutely. Um, but the, the the tricky thing is like so when when I work on it on my inside and you work it on your on you work on yourself on your inside then when we come together we create another inside and that's really what we're going to start talking about um, in the next segment. What do you mean we create another inside like the sum total sum of the parts or? Well, there's your interior, right? Let's say you have an interior, I have my interior. But let's say that you and I really come together and we we become a we like a we space, we connect as a whole on, we bond as a, as a, as friends or as a couple or whatever it may be. Then between us, there's another inside that other people that are on the outside don't experience. Ah, so like the expansion of a bubble. Exactly. Or two bubbles coming together in relationship. There's, 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 there's an inside of that relationship. And that's a, that's another inside. But, but like I said, we'll, we'll go into that, um, that's basically we're talking about connection now. Well, it is that magic time for a commercial break. Yes. Miles and I will be right back to continue this fascinating discussion. So you stay right there. This is Mission Evolution, www.missionevolution.org. So I was watching the X-Zone TV channel last night when I was abducted by aliens and they kept repeating to me over and over again, Simultv.com, Simultv.com. What's Simultv.com? That's what I asked them. They had it written on the side of their UFO. How do you spell that? UFO. No, I mean Simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Right. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Interesting that you were abducted by aliens in a Simultv.com UFO last night. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Now that you mention it, I remember now last night, I was awakened from a deep sleep. My great-grandmother was standing there. She said she'd come from the hereafter to tell me about Simultv.com. She even spelled it out for me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. Wow. Yeah. Guys, you'll never guess what my psychic guru just told me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Exactly. Are you guys psychic too? Of course. We all know about Simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Hi there, this is Mission Evolution, missionevolution.org. Our guest this hour is Miles Kessler. His website, theintricaldojo.com. Miles, we were getting into what happens when you start managing your own interior environment and create that space within yourself and then go into relationship with someone else that's doing the same thing. Would you continue from there? Yeah. So, so we, 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 the station that we kind of, that our train stopped at was this kind of conscious choice or, or the choice maker, or we could say awareness response, centered and aware response. So whenever stimulus comes into the situation, especially if I run into a conflict, my boundary, physical, emotional, mental, ideological boundary, whatever it is, bumps up against another boundary. Everything in us is, gets triggered, wants to fight, flight, freeze, wants to go into the, the, the normal downward spiral of perpetual conflict. But if I can hold the awareness, I can respond from a place of choice. And my choice and, and my and what, however I choose to respond will be coming from a place of awareness. So I can so does that, choose to respond. Does that, way. Does that awareness yeah. um, help us stay present in the moment versus going down the rabbit hole of our past experience? Exactly. Yeah. And I would say that awareness is us staying present in the moment 
without going down the rabbit hole. And that's why it's, that's why there's a choice there. You know, um, Victor Frankl's choice that where, where we find the power, we're empowered and where we find our freedom. So the freedom is like, no, I'm not going to step into the hole and go down the rabbit hole of whatever. I'm going to choose to stay present, open and allow what, what, what is happening to happen. Then from there, we go to the next level of, of development, which is the connected response, or it's more of an intuitive response. So when I'm actually, when I do my inner work and I learn how to kind of know myself, know my triggers, know my emotional needs and fears and desires and all that stuff, know them well without responding, just knowing them, then I can begin from that aware place to start connecting with other people. So I reach out and I actually let them in, let their ideas in, let their beliefs in, let their points of view in, let their perspective in. So is, uh, is this as, as opposed, is this as opposed to everybody getting triggered and then bouncing off of each other's triggers? Exactly. Exactly. Because okay. like you say, the whole, the whole metaphor of bouncing means that there's boundaries there that are bouncing off of each other. When I open up into awareness, what happens over time, it takes a little bit of time, the awareness begins to dissolve those boundaries or certainly relax those boundaries. Now, it is important, I should say, that you know we should have healthy boundaries. So sometimes the awareness will tell us to put a boundary. No, no, I'm going to choose to be boundaried here. Good, but it's coming from choice. If we're um, working with this, do you find that this also, you know, staying present in the moment, um, not going off down the rabbit hole of our past experience, does that also mm-hmm. help us with empathy one for the other and seeing the other person's viewpoint? Well, not necessarily, but that's the next stage. So, <laughs> so once I've established this, then I have to, it, it, in a way, my awareness starts inside, but it radiates outward, it expands outward. And, and also my intention and my attention should, it's, I, I say should because you know some meditators, for example, just go inside themselves and that's it. They disappear and they, they don't relate with the world. But I think that human evolution requires us to start to connect with other people. And when I'm aware of what's happening in my interior, I can begin to become aware through listening and being sensitive of what's happening in another person's into interior. So I, I'm not psychic. I, I don't make any claims to be psychic, but the intuitive response actually starts to pick up. It, it can be it can be very subtle cues. It can be verbal cues. It can be physical cues. It can even be, be intuition that you're just sensing that something else is there. And you begin to know what's happening through an intuitive response. You start to understand through connection, you understand what's happening on uh, the other person's interiors. What are their fears being triggered? Are their desires being triggered? Are there, do they have an agenda happening? Um, is there, is there um, uh, some issue that's, that's playing out there? Uh, are, are there emotions, you know, spiking and, and, and you just start to become sensitive to all of that in a, not a reactive way, but in an open way where you can just accept it, allow it, track it, and then intuitively respond to the other person. And that's why this list level is called the intuitive response. This is when we after all of our awareness training, we start to include the other in our awareness training. And, and it just, we just kind of get this intuitive sense of what's happening on their inside. So is this kind of, you're saying it's the next step and I, I, I'm following, believe it or not. Um, yeah, yeah. You see it's the next step, but is, isn't this the step that we really need to take um, evolutionary oh, wise as, as a world? Yeah. Where we can start to I, embrace I, that as a world. Yeah, and, and that's what, what's helpful about this model, and it, it comes right out of integral theory. It's, you know, it's not, I mean, this particular model, I, I did kind of uh, came up with it, but it's, it's based off of integral theory and spiral dynamics and uh, um, vertical development and evolutionary biology. So it's nothing, uh, you know, it's not, I'm not claiming that this is coming from me, but what's beautiful about the system is that these levels, they're resting on top of each other. That again, you can't have an intuitive connection with somebody else until you have a certain awareness in yourself. You can't have a certain awareness within yourself until you develop the ability to choose to have awareness. You can't develop the ability to choose to have awareness until you somehow work through the emotional reactions that we all have. You can't work through those until you've overcome your survival instincts of fight, flight, freeze. 
So there, there, there's a kind of a cause and effect developmental approach here. And so what you say is this what we need in the world? Actually, what we need in the world is the next stage. But yes, we can't have the next stage without this stage. This is where we really start to kind of um, uh, open up to and accept everybody else for who they are, regardless of the differences. Doesn't mean we have to give up my point of view. I just have to start accepting where they are. It, it would appear that through all this introspection, you actually become more solid in who you truly are versus um, more maneuverable by other because you're open to it. Is that accurate? Um, in the long run, that's accurate. Okay. So in other words, when I start to, when, look, every developmental stage, you know, we can, we can, uh, there's so many ways that we can go off track, but generally speaking, what I'm talking about is very kind of simple waves that we move through. Excuse me. It's never that clear cut. You know, it's always a development is always a much more messy affair. Sometimes I could be uh, doing going into a regression temporarily so and building up the you know going back and working out some stuff so I can actually continue to evolve forward um, but generally speaking yes that we will kind of evolve through these waves and um, and just become more functional within each one of them so we have to go back to ground zero sometimes uh, yeah more than more than more than sometimes, especially if I have, again, I didn't want to get into shadow work uh, in this session because it's, it's, it's a whole other topic, but if I have some unresolved shadow issues, let's say in my, in my, in, at an emotional level, or even in awareness level, you know, I use meditation to compensate for something I don't want to look at. If I have some unresolved stuff, I have to go back and clean that up. So that, that is a very real thing. And, and that's why I said it's a messy affair sometimes. But generally speaking, we will evolve. You know, we'll move through these stages. And it's the intuitive response is such a key because we, so, we, we just start to really appreciate the inner perspective of others. Doesn't mean we have to agree with it, although this stage does tend to be very agreeable and very um, uh, compatible. But... You know, Doesn't, human, does it allow so. for further growth, further personal growth when you have perspective of other? Yeah, well, I, I personally, I don't think you can have further personal growth. growth. I, I think that that is the key. I, I keep saying there's a lot of keys, but that is a key phase that we must move through uh, into, into understanding other people. You know, the more we understand ourselves, the more we'll understand others. And the more we understand others, the more that this kind of zero sum um, uh, result of conflict starts to heal. Relationships start to heal. Cultures start to heal. Um, uh, governments and countries and, and races start to heal. Uh, genders start to heal. The world starts to heal. And I say start to heal because we have to go one step further for that to happen. But, but yeah, that's the beginning of the healing process. Well, meditation has been around how long now? Oh, <laughs> probably as long as humans. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, Buddhism has been around 2,500 years. So there's that. But there's, oh, you know, Hindu meditation is much older. Jewish meditation is much older. And yet here we are in this mess. So right. has there, there's a tool that's been present for since forever. And yet we're in this mess. Why, 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 why is that? Why is this powerful tool out there and yet here we are well two two ways to respond to that first the tool is out there but it's always a minority of people who have been interested in some type of mystical experiences mystical truths understanding the universe i'm sure every human being at some point wonders oh gee who am i what is this all about i'm sure that every human being goes through that at some point but if you look at all the hu human beings, the men and women who've actually stopped their lives and say, no, I'm going to commit my life to these questions, that's a minority. It's, it's you know, 1% of humanity. So that's one reason. The majority of humanity, that's, they just don't have such, either they don't have such inclinations or they don't have the resources in their life to do that. They're just busy, you know, making, getting by. So that's one reason. The other reason um, is that it's not about meditation, what I'm talking about. Meditation is what gives us the awareness to do this work. Um, and, you know, even becoming in, you can become enlightened, but still not understand what um, uh, evolution is. The Buddha didn't, 
didn't know what evolution was because, I mean, may, who knows? Maybe he did. But evolution as, you know, from Darwin on, the way that you and I understand evolution um, wasn't around until, you know, what, the last 150 years or something like that. So there was no, even, not even a concept that the Greeks weren't talking about evolution. You know, the, the Chinese weren't talking about evolution. It's kind of a new concept. And it's not that it's a new concept for humans. Humans developed to the stage where we started to understand that, wait a second, systemically, there's something happening here. And that brings us actually to the next stage of response. And again, these are awakening of, of, of capacities and perspectives in our consciousness that happen. And I'll just say one quick thing about how this happens. Do we have one more segment? We do. This? Okay, great. You're so not getting I, rid of me that easily. <laughs> no, no, no. I just want to, I'm trying to kind of parse this out. Um, before I talk about that, that, that key next stage of development, um, the, pr the way we develop is that the problem of one stage of development gets solved at the next stage of development. I'll say okay. it again. The problem of one stage of development, the solution for that is when we evolve to another stage. Like Einstein say, the problem, you know, the, the level of problems can't be solved at the level that they were created. The problem of one stage of development it's like my two-year-old daughter, you know, she had problems. And then when she became three-year-old, she, she didn't have those problems anymore. She could walk around and play. And she, then she had other problems. She was breaking stuff and whatever. So, But the problems, they get solved at the next stage of development. And those solutions, and here's the key that we have to understand, it's so beautifully designed, those solutions become the new problem to, to reach the next stage of development. So it's like a ladder of problem resolution, problem of resolution that is created and is created through a dialectic, a dialectical uh, capacity of how we relate to the world. So and we have it's not to a, embrace problems. Sorry, please. It, it's, so it's, it's not a matter of arriving? Well, it, uh, you know, in some cases it is arriving, but in other cases, you know, it's like, uh, well, look at babies. Some babies just arrive, whoop, whoop, there it is. The baby came out and very little contractions or whatever. Other times the, the contractions and, the, and the, the labor pains are tremendous. So, and even for the same person, it could be different according to child or according to the, the number of births. So in a way, yeah, sometimes people slide and they just arrive, like you say, and God bless them, you know, they have good karma. Other times for most of us, I don't know about you, but me, um, it's, it's, it's some, it's not like we have to work hard like Sisyphus, um, but it can be, it can be hard going through these things and we need some compassion and self-care and support and, you know. Well, it's time to close out this segment and get ready for the next one. Please stay with us as Miles and I continue to explore the evolution of global consciousness. This is Mission Evolution, www.missionevolution.org. From the Canada-US border in the southern region of Niagara, traveling north in Ontario's Golden Horseshoe, then, east and west of the Greater Toronto Area, there is growing awareness and excitement as more and more people are starting their day with Beautiful Mind Coffee, the delicious healthy coffee that your brain will love. Made with ethically sourced 100% Arabica coffee, Beautiful Mind Coffee is roasted and ground in small batches, to ensure each bag contains a wonderful full-bodied artisan coffee. Scientifically formulated, Beautiful Mind Coffee is the only coffee blend that contains three herbal ingredients found to aid in boosting your daily mental clarity and focus. Maca root powder, green tea extract and American ginseng, have been selected for their ability to support good brain health. Taking care of your brain's health now can help delay or prevent the onset of cognitive dysfunction, including dementia, Alzheimer's, and more general memory loss as you get older just by enjoying the delicious flavor of our roasted coffee and herbal ingredients found exclusively in Beautiful Mind Coffee. Beautiful Mind Coffee is now available at Amazon.ca and soon to be available in selected locations near you. 
In Hamilton, Ontario, Beautiful Mind Coffee is now available at Livelong Wellness Clinic, located at 189 Houston Street South. Beautiful Mind Coffee can be ordered by telephone by calling 416-436-3675 or 905-536-2450. Why have a good cup of coffee when you can have a great cup of Beautiful Mind Coffee that's good for your brain? For more information on Beautiful Mind Coffee, visit us online at www.beautifulmindcoffee.ca. Welcome back. This is Mission Evolution, missionevolution.org. This hour, our expert guest is Miles Kessler. His website, theintricaldojo.com. Miles, we were going to go into the last stage or um, the final key, if you will, on this uh, evolutionary process you've been discussing. What is it? Right. So, so what I was saying before about the problem of one stage of development gets solved at the next stage of development. So when I start to create awareness... And, and, and I really, let's say I really stabilize and I become aware and I can contain all of my, my reactivity and, and instincts that come up and be in a more or less calm and tranquil and peaceful place. Um, an interesting thing happens is that I'm a little bit detached from the world. And the problem is that, wait a second, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not connecting to people. The solution is to connect, but not to connect through, hey, let's connect, but to connect from awareness. So that's the solution. And then the solution when I, when I do that is I discover, oh my God, other human beings have a beautiful interior. And not only that, they have the same hard time that I have. They have the same joy, the same uh, sadness, the same fears, et cetera. And we start to connect. And that's where we have the intuitive response. We begin to be able to intuitively respond to people. You can respond to me. I can respond to you in a way that doesn't, hasn't really happened before that. That's the station that we're at right now. But what's the what do shortcoming you mean? of what do you, yeah, yeah, what, do you, what do you mean intuitive response? Help me with that one a little bit. Describe that. Well, yeah. So if I really kind of feel into your question, I need to stop my mind, connect with uh, Gwilda for a moment, and, and really see what's the best way for me to answer the question. And, and what, I, what I'm intuitively getting is that part of your question was to get me to clarify a little bit this stage that I'm talking about. What does that mean? The way we're intuitively responding to, to people. Another part as the, as the host, you probably, I'm, and this is again, intuitively, I'm, I could be wrong. I imagine you wanted me to somehow clarify this for the people that might be listening. So that little turn that I just took to answer that question was from actually stopping where my mind was going and wait a second what's what is Gwilda actually asking me here and connecting with you to respond so it's just that was just kind of a little example of it now the way that Perfect. that could so, manifest in, yeah the way that that could manifest in, in a conflict would be just to kind of diffuse things and de-escalate it's like okay hang on a second all right let's start over let me get back in my center okay I, i'm here to listen to you what's going on and then it can change you know, it can de-escalate and go in a very different direction. So if you take that moment uh, to really tune into the other person, it gives you a deeper understanding of um, where they're coming from so that you can respond accordingly? Well, yeah, it gives you a deeper understanding, but it's not so you can respond accord- accordingly. I mean, yes, that's true. But what happens is that your response starts to intuitively emerge. So I get, oh, I get that. And this is how I emerge. This is, it, it becomes natural how I respond to you. It comes not out of my mind. Anything I take uh, out of my mind as a way to respond is from the past. Mm-hmm. And that's not right. intuitive. That's cognitive uh, memory, et cetera. But to really intuitively respond to you in the moment, I've got to stop, listen to you, be touched by you one way or the other. And then the, that will evoke a response out of me. Does that filter that out what would be normal? Does that filter out what I'll would normally be 
<laughs> Does that filter out what would normally be a knee-jerk reaction at the lower levels? Totally, 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 totally. Yeah, that filters that out. And what happens is that response, it filters out the knee-jerk reaction and it filters out the 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 responses that could still be a response, but kind of like, oh, this is happening. I need to respond this way. Still coming from the mind. What it does is it it, it makes my response completely appropriate to what's arising in the present moment and we both feel that because i'm not just doing it but if you're also a practitioner you would be doing it and if you're not a practitioner it, it invites you into listening and, and connecting in that way connecting with another person in an open non-invasive um, safe way clear clean way healthy way invites them to connect in the same way with us so there's no challenge there. Is is that what you're saying? There's, um, oh, no, there's the conflict there's, I mean, or the or the conflict has well, kind of been removed because you're open. Well, I, yeah, yes and no. The conflict can still be there. You know, you might want to watch Netflix. I might want to go for a walk or whatever. We, 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 the conflict can still be there, but the charge is allowed to move through. It doesn't get knotted up and entangled. So the charge moves through and at some point, okay, we look at each other and say, so how are we going to resolve this conflict? So the conflict can be there, but all the charge around it and all the um, hijacking around it can it becomes completely diminished. So it sounds like a wonderful goal here, uh, you know, kind of relationships I think most of us would really like to engage in, but it also sounds like a long road to get there. How does a person start? Well, you know what, let me, I, 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 I would, because it, now we're in our last segment, we got to get to the last stage and then maybe I'll come oh, back. Oh, there's one more stage. Question. Okay. Well, we, we, we haven't got there yet. Remember, it, there's a, each stage of development has a problem that gets solved at the next stage. What's the problem of this stage is that we're connecting so well with each other, but then what about the world? What about the world? What about all this? Really what your first question was, what about that? So that's the next stage of, of development. That's called the creative response. So we went from survival response to, uh, to, in, to emotional response, to choice maker, to awareness response, to um, uh, intuitive response. And now at this next level, creative response. Uh, Gwilda, when you're an open, aware, and integrated system, you know, you're, you're completely aware of your body, mind, heart, spirit, and you connect with me, as an open, aware, integrated system. And I connect with you as an open, aware, integrated system. What happens is that you and I create through that interface, through that really deep connection, we create an open and aware uh, living system. And it's not, it's not Gwilda plus Miles equals Gwilda and Miles. No, it creates, a, it's a sum, the, 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 the sum is much greater than the parts. And that system has its own intelligence. So it's not Miles saying, oh, you know what? I'm not going to do Netflix tonight. Let's go for the walk. Or, or it's not it's not Gwilda saying, no, let's go ahead and do go for the walk. Forget it. It's not coming from our minds. The system itself shows us the solution. So we really take is, our hands off the steering wheel. We take our hands off the does, steering wheel and the conflict resolves itself. Does the system interface with life in general? And, and part of its intelligence is blending then your choices with the world at large and the way things are moving? Well, the system is life in general, and, and you and I interface with life in general in a much bigger way, in a completely impersonal and spiritual way. So we, we actually become a, a, um, a living, awake and aware, connected, interconnected, part of a greater system. And conflict is normal in nature. If you look at nature, conflict and stress is normal in nature, but conflict, the energy of conflict always, always has a, a direction it wants to go to resolve. But when, when I'm personal, I have my agenda. You might have your agenda and whatever our agendas are, it's never the, the agenda. It's never the same as the energy of that direction or the direction of that energy. But if you and I can stay open and connected and, and aware without an agenda, we know where that energy wants to go. That energy wants to go through us systemic, systemically and it resolves itself. And it resolves itself in a way that I don't have to sacrifice myself, my beliefs. You don't have to sacrifice your beliefs. And yet we, we, we evolve to a greater, a greater perspective that includes the whole. 
do, do our agendas come more out of our patterning and our fear than um, out of our being present? Yeah, you could say that. I mean, there are, I suppose there's good agendas, you know, but like the old saying, you know, the, the road to hell was paved with good intentions. So that could also be the case. But I think what, what happens is, um, is that we just align with a greater, I, I don't even know if it's right to say an agenda of nature or the universe, the universe has its own agenda. The universe has its, its it, there's a pattern in nature. And we align with that in a way that um, that that makes things um, that heals. It doesn't just heal me, which my personal work did. It doesn't just heal our relationship, which our relational uh, awareness does. But it heals it heals um, the, the the universe in a way. It heals nature. It heals the world. It heals anything that's systemic. We start to see systemically at this level, and not just see systemically, like from our minds, but we start to intuitively feel into the system and especially where the system is under stress. And then we naturally address the, the system that's under stress. So again, I'm going to go back to my original yeah. question at the beginning of this segment. This sounds wonderful and I see absolutely the mm -hmm. logic and the progression of it. However, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a tall order. How does a person get started? You, know, you start where you're at. I mean, you know, I, I would say many people, especially if you're, you know, North America, Europe, you know, if you're, if you're, our, our cultures certainly have problems, but also, you know, I mean, when I was a kid, there was a show called Divorce Court on TV. It was, it was, maybe you remember it, but it was about actors were, you know, doing a divorce scene and the judge was an actor and the, and the men and the women were actors. These days, you know, Dr. Phil's been on forever. Our culture is pretty awake and aware of, of, of human development, even though we don't always act like it. Um, so many people already have a, have a lot of this going, but you know, it's like the old saying, when's the best time to build a tree? Well, 20 years ago, when's the second best time to build a tree? Today, right now. Did I say build a tree? I meant plant a tree, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is now. And um, you, know, you start where you're at. What do we do? We start where we're at. Excuse me? What do we do? We start where we're at, but what do we do? Yeah, well, you you, you have conversations like you and I are having. One, uh, you listen to, uh, no, I'm going to plug your show. You listen to Med Evolution, uh, Mission Evolution Radio, number two. Um, and ideally, you take on a practice. You know, conversations are a way of practice. Uh, listening to Dharma, listening to radio shows and podcasts are a form of practice. Sitting down in meditation is a form of practice. Going to therapy is a form of practice. Um, working on uh, healing relationships, healing our culture, um, whatever. There's so many things that you can do. Um, I wouldn't say pick what you want. I would say what is calling you. You can be motivated by either pain and you just don't want to accept that anymore. So you're motivated to do something and you'll, you'll be drawn to some practice or therapy or whatever, or you may be called by aspirations. Like you just see, you know, the Dalai Lama, or you see, I don't know, um, you, you, you see um, Nelson Mandela, and they're just so inspiring that they pull you in. And that's important well, when we're, we are inspired. Yeah, we're out of time, we're, okay. We're well, almost follow out of time. Your inspiration. Yeah. <laughs> but before we close, I have to ask you, Miles, what is your yeah. mission? Oh, my mission, oh wow, yeah. Um, well, it was for years, it was inward and now it's much more outward. So there was that kind of that arc. And my mission is to, is to help other people in this work. Yeah. Period. You know, continue con a continuation of my own practice of my own development is, um, it, some, a certain amount of it is solo, but a large amount of it is helping others, uh, in their, in their personal development. And do you and find, it. um, that you continually cycle through, um, these stages that we've been talking about for the past hour. Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, they're all in me still. I'm not. I haven't like climbed the top of the ladder and I'm free. No, no, they, they're they're all in me, and I backslide as much as the next person. Um, but what's beautiful, I also find that I'm working with others as they're going through these stages. It has a magical, unintentionally, but magical um, integration process in my own interior. So yeah, it's always so. Anytime, spiral anytime we genuinely. Down. Anytime we genuinely interface with another, we, are we not changed? 
Absolutely. As are they. They're changed. We're changed. And the system is changed hmm. for the better. Just amazing. For the better. Well, it's, it's been wonderful spending time with you and uh, listening to um, these wonderful stages. It's very inspirational. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for joining yeah, us you, on Linda. the show. It's been my pleasure. Our guest this hour has been Miles Keschler. Miles is dedicated to helping people embrace the practice of mindfulness, progress through the development of meditative insight, and evolve embodied expression of Dharma into the world. His website, theintercaldojo.com. This has been Mission Evolution with Golda Wiecka. For more information or to enjoy past archived episodes, visit www.missionevolution.org. Please be sure to join us right here next time as this mission continues, bringing information, resources, and support to our evolving world. Mm -hmm.